Uh, I can see the screen. I don't know what happened. Do, do you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, so I don't see what you are seeing, but uh, I can see my screen. <laughs> well, actually, everything is good. So I can okay. see the questions. So um, together with Alexei, we compiled a list of questions, uh, which I suppose you are seeing. Um, discussion session on heavy quarks and heavy quarkonia. So I will briefly go through uh, two slides. The first one is about proton-proton uh, topics and the second one about heavy ion topics and then we can start the discussion. And uh, I hope we will uh, have uh, some people participating while trying to keep things uh, efficient. Uh, it's, it's already quite late. So. Um, let me go through the first uh, page. Uh, how can we make reliable theory to data comparisons and in particular LDME determinations in the framework of NRGCD? How can the accuracy of non-perturbative methods in Hadron physics be improved? Uh, can the theoretical uncertainties be decreased? Uh, those things go together, of course. Um, and in particular, can the difficulties including uh, NLO or even higher order corrections uh, be solved. Then we move to a different topic. Uh, how can we understand the difference between the LHC, B, and CELEX uh, experimental results on the mass of the Xi CC? Then a few questions about uh, tetraquarks. Uh, what are the nature, structure, and quantum numbers of the tetraquarks observed by LHCB? Do some tetraquarks candidate exist, uh, such as the X5568. Uh, what is the nature of the X6900? I, I must confess, I have some doubts about the usefulness of uh, discussing extremely generic questions of this kind. Uh, what are the nature, structure, and quantum numbers of tetraquarks? I, I think these are questions that deserve um, a whole day of uh, of discussion, not uh, not five minutes. And uh, since we don't have many more minutes than five, I I wonder if we should really go into this, <laughs> but we can try. Um, how can we decide between the compact uh, multi-quark and the hadron molecule uh, models to explain, for instance, the X3872? I also fear that this will uh, generate. Uh, a very long discussion. Uh, why is it that LHCB reported no mass hypothesis in the range 17.5 uh, uh, to 20 GeV in the Upsilon mu mu uh, invariant mass distribution? And then uh, we have a second slide with uh, four sets of uh, questions about uh, the, the heavy ion part. Um, what is the key evidence for melting of quarkonia at high temperature from lattice QCD? How reliable are the Bayesian methods for the spectral function reconstruction at high temperature, given that the temporal uh, extent is small? Are the quarkonium correlators at T bigger than zero consistent between lattice and the potential model with color screening? Then another question uh, is, uh, okay, we have seen that uh, for equilibrium, cases, uh, things uh, work uh, reasonably well, but uh, can non-equilibrium dynamics uh, also be included in studies of in medium botomonia, in particular at early times and uh, dilute uh, QGP regions? And then uh, one other question that I think we may not be able to efficiently discuss, will future data on botomonium elliptic flow be precise enough to constrain models? I think this is an open-ended question. We will not be able to answer it. We need higher precision on RAA of the excited states. Uh, can the lessons learned in the bottomonium system be extended to Germania? <clears throat> well, I, I doubt we can discuss this, but uh, we can try. And finally, <clears throat> the solution of the lean plot equation for the reduced density matrix is numerically expensive, <clears throat> even when using the quantum trajectories approach. Could something be done about that? Uh, for instance, an expansion in the number of quantum jumps, could that reduce the, the CPU um, 
needs for these kind of calculations. So let me start with the first uh, question um, for which I have prepared myself a few, a few slides um, based on talks we have seen in the afternoon. How can we make reliable theory to data comparisons? Um, so let me go back, go immediately to this, to this question and then, and then we can discuss. So in particular, the, 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 the issue is that uh, we need to do a reliable treatment of the experimental uncertainties and uh, correlations between observables. Um, uh, clearly, only the statistical uncertainties are independent uh, from measurement to measurement and from bin to bin, for instance, in a PT distribution. Systematic uncertainties are very often, uh, at least in part, correlated from bin to bin for a given measurement and sometimes also between different measurements within one experiment or even among different experiments. For instance, uh, all the luminosity uncertainties are common to the J psi, psi prime, upsilon and so on measured by one given experiment if they use the same trigger and the same data sets and so on. And uh, for instance, uh, branching fractions are common between LHCB and Atlas and, and CMS and so on. They are, uh, if you change one branching fraction uh, to uh, derive uh, cross-section from a branching fraction times cross-section cross uh, measurement, uh, you will affect uh, simultaneously all the measurements by all the experiments. So these are important things when comparing data to experiment, how to deal with the uncertainties. Um, and one particular example of a very crucial um, correlation between the uh, observables is the, 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 the dependence of the cross-sections on the assumed polarization. So this, this is a topic that was discussed a couple of times during the, the afternoon. Um, and uh, in particular, I think it affects another two talks. So the experiments publish uh, the cross-sections that are measured under the assumption of unpolarized uh, production, but they also publish tables with uh, correction factors that should be applied to those values in case uh, somebody wants to assume any other pol polarization scenario, including the most extreme scenarios, uh, transverse and longitudinal polarizations. So any intermediate polarization, like lambda theta equals to 0 0.4, for instance, can be introduced as, a, as an input and you can easily determine what is the corresponding cross-section. And this effect needs to be taken into account during the fit. Uh, if you instead take the unpolarized cross-section published by the experiment uh, as, a, as a default table, and then you extract the long distance matrix elements from that PT differential cross section. And then you infer the polarization corresponding to those long distance matrix elements. And you get, for instance, that the polarization is uh, transverse. Well, you cannot stop there. You have to then go back and uh, see uh, what shall I do now? Because the, you started from unpolarized cross-sections, you derived that after all, the production should be transversely polarized. Uh, so there is an inconsistency between what you assumed, what was used for the acceptance correction, and what you conclude from your analysis. So there is an iterative procedure that must be applied, otherwise uh, you get a biased uh, result. So this can be very easily um, uh, illustrated by these uh, figures. I, I hope you are um, able to see them. They were shown, I, I believe, by Mariana in her talk this afternoon. Uh, it shows uh, the published KC2 over KC1 cross-section ratio as a function of PT published by Atlas and CMS on the left, and also by LHCB on the right, using two different uh, measurements with electromagnetic colorimeters or with uh, um, tracking uh, co uh, the conversions of the photon into E plus and minus pairs. And you see that if you assume a certain polarization scenario, for instance, on the right the figure, you see that the LHCB and Atlas and CMS results are all over the place. They are not really following each other very nicely. 
Instead, if you assume the other polarization scenario, uh, all the points are very nicely overlapping with each other. So uh, these are measurements. I mean, they are not theory, they are measurements. They are just as good measurements in the two cases. It's just a matter of what is the assumption that you take when you compute the detection acceptance. So it's, you cannot say that one is data and the other is a model. No, they are both data. And um, if you take the default, let's say, unpolarized uh, production, um, you cannot say that this is more data than anything else. Um, and these are important things, uh, how to handle this, this uh, polarization cross-section uh, correlation. For instance, uh, this other slide also shown by Mariana shows that uh, depending on whether you do the correct thing or not, you can derive uh, very different uh, conclusions. Uh, for instance, from the same um, measurement, from the same data, um, and also from the same theoretical inputs, the same SDCs for the 3S1 octet, and for the 3P0 singlet, you, you derive very different values for this uh, ratio of the, of the uh, matrix elements uh, with very different precision because in one case the whole polarization envelope is assumed to be an experimental uncertainty, like a statistical uncertainty, while in the other case um, it is uh, correctly done uh, the, the correlation between the polarization and the section. It's a function, it's not an uncertainty. One thing depends on the other. That doesn't mean that uh, it is uncertain. And the second topic is uh, also uh, related to uncertainties, but now on the side of the theory. Um, so we have also seen that sometimes the theoretical uncertainties are not part of the fit itself, but rather are added a posteriori on the top of the resulting uh, fitted curve. And uh, clearly, in this case, one cannot look at the uh, goodness of fit and uh, conclude if the fit is good or not. Um, one can have uh, a very bad fit that actually looks good once you add this uh, uncertainty band on the top of uh, a posteriori, once the fit is finished. Uh, for instance, uh, the lack of the low PT uh, downturn in the SDCs calculated to text to living order is an obvious example of an uncertainty in the calculation. Uh, well, it could even be, one could even use a different word uh, instead of uncertainty. One could say that it is a bias in the, in the calculation because it is missing something. It's not just an uncertainty, but okay. It's an example of an uncertainty if you want to, to, to see it like that. And for sure, this kind of uh, bias or uncertainty is not accounted for by the scale variations that uh, one usually sees in the, in the fits uh, which are published. So even though we all agree that it is very difficult to evaluate theoretical uncertainties, um, one should be aware of this problem and, and study the limitations of the calculations before imposing that one given calculation must describe the, the data. I mean, just to recall what was shown, I believe, by Pietro, uh, this is um, the data points are inside the, the uncertainty band. However, that band is not an uncertainty band uh, that uh, can be seen as a, as a fit uncertainty band. It has nothing to do with the statistical um, analysis of uncertainties. So this was the, the first topic um, in the list that, that we had for discussion. Um, if you want, if, if so, I, I don't see any more anybody, I don't know if someone is raising the hand or not. I'm sorry. Um, if not, we go to the next point. Otherwise, just speak because I, I cannot see. Um. Yeah, there's no uh, hand raised. So. Okay. So then um, the next uh, topic is uh, how can the accuracy of non-perturbative methods in Hadron physics be improved? Can the theoretical uncertainties be decreased? And uh, can we handle the difficulties with including uh, higher order corrections? Um, so I would like to ask anyone who has an opinion about these things to come forward now. OK, 
Okay. We must first define which non-perturbative uh, effects, perhaps. I have a similar question regarding the question. Is this to the perturbation theory because it's something about NLO? For example, lattice QCD is also a non perturbative method, or maybe whoever posted the question could say a few more words about it. Uh, let us concentrate on lattice gauge theory and uh, define the conditions when we can improve the results of lattice gauge theory formulation. Numerical experiments, for example. Because lattice gauge theory is important by themselves as a theoretical tool without any experimental numerical experiments. For example, uh, confinement you can obtain in one string in the high temperature expansion. And that was the main statement of Wilson's first paper in gauge theory on the lattice. Just by Plucket counting inside the Wilson loop. It's very easy. In inverse coupling constant expansion. But then question is, uh, it is lattice result. It is not continual result in continual space. And question is how to transfer this result into the continuum case. If we suppose that uh, real space is lattice, not continuum, then everything is okay. So if we take background as some lattice and some non, in homogeneous condensates indicates that we can take background as a lattice, then to prove component like results will be easier. Okay, are there any questions? May I comment? On this, um, I, I mean, I, I'm a lattice person, and at least in my opinion, the, the finite lattice spacing is not really the problem. You can, and typically it's done uh, to compute at several different lattice spacings, and you can analytically derive the yeah, dependence in which power of the lattice spacing the error comes. I think there are much more severe sources of error or potential problems. For example, many of these exotic states we have seen in the past talks, uh, there's an exponential explosion in the statistical errors, which have nothing to do with discretization errors. Also the resonance business, typically a, a theoretician likes to go to complex energies, define poles, and the lattice can only uh, yeah, compute real energies, and you need to make assumptions and extrapolate. So, so I would say, say the dominating source of errors are these things rather than the finite lattice spacing. Well, from the other point of view, if yeah. we see. I have, I have uh, uh, okay, calculations. Uh, this is as easy. Uh, I use the QCD samples as one of the powerful uh, techniques in hadron physics. Uh, I think uh, in uh, this method uh, uh, to reduce the uncertainties, it is better to consider the difference of some rules or the ratio of two some to extract the physical quantities instead of instead of uh, uh, only moves and one quantity. This reduces uh, the uncertainty and uncertainty of uh, in the form of ratio or difference that may uh, cancel each other and we can. Uh, we get uh, 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 accurate results for uh, the parameters of the hard drive. 
Then I can continue a smooth talk before questions, urgent questions appear. From the point of view of applied mathematics or computational mathematics, many algorithms used in theoretical physics for calculations are intractable. They are not polynomial. For example, perturbation theory uh, calculations in field theory. In each order, number of Feynman integrals rise as factorial. And each integral becomes more complicated. So in the sense of the computational physics to calculate higher loops, if they are, we are need them, is non-polynomial. So it is not calculable uh, algorithms. There are other way, other algorithms. For example, if we take as uh, artificial regularization string model for the field theory as regularization, uh, for strings we have in each order, just one diagram, not factorially raised number, just one. So effectively, string perturbation theory sums factorially many diagrams. And it is enough to calculate one loop uh, uh, string Feynman hmm, corresponding to Feynman diagram, and then make low energy limit. So factorial, we cancel it. So it depends on the algorithm, how to calculate. Similarly, but not uh, the polynomial and exponential. We are calculated uh, in lattice gauge theory in Euclidean formulation and so on. Yes, but uh, who calculates the uh, algorithm, uh, poly, they are they a polynomial or not? They, as a rule, at, are not computation. If you raise the volume or make small step, the resources rise not polynomially, but much more. So uh, they uh, applied mathematicians do not start to work with these algorithms. So we must think before that we ask to uh, construct next computer in uh, some hopes, but appears after 10 years that uh, the progress is minimal. That is gauge theory exists already since 74. Almost well, I, I guess one needs to said. distinguish which problem we want to solve, right? If you want to solve QCD phase diagram or real-time dynamics, that's exponentially hard problem. If you want to solve bound states, then again, it depends on the complexity, but in principle, spectrum of, of, of hadrons, of certain hadrons, right? It depends how close to the threshold is, is a polynomial problem that's been known very well. So things like hadron spectrum, in principle, is polynomial. The other things, hadron decay, phase diagram at finite density, which are known to be uh, exponentially hard. So, so one has to focus on the, one has to define which problem we want to solve. I mean, in problems which, which uh, can be solved, right, easily, I mean, the progress has been tremendous. And other areas which are exponentially hard, obviously, the progress was minimal. So it depends which problem you want to solve. Yes, but anyway, we need to include fermions, right? Uh, fermions is, is, of course, included since long. Physical mass is included since long time. Continuum limit is also sure. con uh, consistently being taken. So, so it's a precision physics Let in many areas of hadronics. 
mode doubling and so on. So well, the doubling is, is a lattice artifacts which go away in the continuum limit. So that has been understood. That's not an issue. Yes, but chirality lost. Well, ca chirality is also where it's important. Well, first of all, chirality is not an issue again if you take the continuum limit. I mean, there are cases in decay where chiral symmetry um, makes, or absence of chiral symmetry makes your life miserable because operator mixing, because you don't have the proper symmetry of operator mixing. But of course, to some extent, that also has been solved by uh, overlap or domain wall fermions. I mean, the, the conceptual problem which has not been solved is chiral gauge theory, but that's beyond QCD, right? So that's when you have non-vector coupling. Uh, so that has, has not been solved as a conceptual problem, which is outstanding, but that, that's beyond hadron physics. So for hadron physics, we have, in principle, the tool to address many problems, uh, including those which are sensitive to chiral physics. The issue is that, that of course, there are also problems which are which are polynomial but very hard, and there are problems which are exponentially hard. So those are not going to be solved by lattice QCD. Can anyone say that real scattering process can be at any at some future time calculated on lattice gauge theory? No, that's exponentially hard problem. A real scattering process cannot be calculated on so the lattice. With exception, right? If you go to low energy scattering, exception. few particles. Uh, experiment are of the of the type. Well, I mean, if you if you ask a proton 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 cross section, that of course will never be calculated by lattice QCD. That's not let me not a problem that you could solve by lattice QCD. Make a quick step to another from another angle. Who is of us is ready? to start working with quantum computers. Half of persons here are uh, specialists in numerical experiments. They are experimentalists in the applied mathematics. They are working in applied mathematics, really, but naively. We see that big uh, organizations, every country, including Russia, had their program in the quantum information theory. Here we see the most uh, advanced scientists. And it appears that no one of them is ready to start to working on quantum computers. Well, there is a good reason for that. I mean, uh, non abelian and lattice gauge series probably the most complicated to put on quantum computers. Yes. And I can uh, prove that any physically interesting problem, computational problem, can be formulated in the language of contemporary quantum computer model. Mathematicians do not know that result. They are, to be uh, true, uh, they invented two famous algorithms, factorization of integer number and search in not orderly set, right? They, they are mathematical problems or applied mathematical problems. And during long time, people say, oh, you know, Quantum computers are rather special, just some problems. Let me show you that any sensible theoretical calculable problem can be so uh, algorithms are common algorithms, general universal algorithms that you can do it on quantum computers. The main statement of quantum information theory is the following. Every algorithm can be for, formulated just in by uh, elementary steps are two, two gates. So two logical, uh, is it okay that I'm uh, talking about quantum information theory? Or you may stop me anytime when any question appears, right? Let us agree. Then I can, will continue. Uh, 
the main statement, right. uh, in, most in, fundamental. We have a few other questions that people okay. have already asked. So maybe maybe we could first try to go through a few others and then we can come back to this point. Okay. So, uh, so the next question in our list is, uh, how can we understand the difference between the experimental results of LHCB and CELEX regarding the mass of the only observed doubly charmed baryon, the Xi CC? Maybe someone can uh, jump on this particular question. I am not an expert, but is it possible that uh, Celex, they simply had a mistake? How they confirm the, their results? I don't know. I... Alexei, maybe you can repeat. I, I don't know if. Uh... Uh, actually, my question was. Uh, so, uh, my question was uh, have. So, uh, the question that we are discussing right now what is the difference between uh, two results about uh, variant mass, correct? Select and oscillating. So, my question was uh, have select confirmed, confirmed the, uh, the result? I mean, so. The, the first version of this state was made by the SEDEX collaboration in 2002 and then confirmed it in 2000. The, uh, the measured value was uh, about 3,500, 3, but the LHCB in 2007 uh, measured it, the mass uh, 3,621. 3, the difference between these two states, uh, and uh, we we are, cannot see such a different case of light baryons or baryons with a single heavy quark, uh, and this is a puzzle, uh, right? Uh, uh, because the only is that the LHCB collaboration observed the chi CC++ plus plus with two uh, plus charge, but the uh, SEDEX uh, was the uh, mass measurement on the chi CC++ plus only with one plus sign. Uh, so there is a, a difference in uh, their core content is of LHCB CU and the uh, SEDEX KCE. Uh, a chain uh, up quark with down quark cannot lead to such a big difference. So this is it now. But uh, there are some works in there uh, that address the uh, uh, um, uh, issue and uh, conclude that both of the experiments are right. Uh, the condition in, uh, in the are different, so uh, uh, those can lead uh, to a uh, uh, big difference, and we need more good uh, results from advance in future for to uh, understand what is done uh, exactly such a big uh, difference. Okay, are there okay. any question? Okay, so I think uh, we can move to the next question. So let me take now one from the batch that we got uh, regarding uh, heavy ions. What is the key evidence for melting of corconia at high temperature from lattice QCD? How reliable are the Bayesian methods for the spectral function reconstruction at high temperature, given that the temporal extent is small? And finally, 
are the quarkonium correlators at uh, uh, temperature bigger than zero consistent between the lattice and the potential model with color screening? I don't know who was um, who wants to comment on these questions. If no one answers this question, maybe I could try to an answer yeah. it. Um, but only in the first two questions, as uh, they are kind of related. I mean, uh, of course, uh, the small extent, small temporal extent, is a problem. But um, we could we could still. Uh, learn from the spectral function. I mean, um, of course, uh, the, a direct evidence would be the disappearing of the uh, redness peak in the spectral function. And we could use, for instance, some Bayesian method to extract the spectral function from the lattice correlators. Sometimes we could uh, get some uh, peak-like structure in the spectral function, but uh, but in but it may uh, not. Uh, but it, it may uh, not be the a real uh, uh, bond state. Bond state, let's say, because we have some uh, uncertainties in the uh, reconstruction. Uh, for instance, uh, maximum entropy method. That's one of the uh, best method. Um, in that method, we could have some. Uh, estimate for the reconstructed uh, redness peak. Uh, so we could check the um, mean and the variance of the significance of the redness peak and compare it to, with uh, the structures in other frequency part and see whether they are close to each other or not. If, uh, for instance, some peaks, the, the mean of a peak structure is uh, much larger than the other parts and its uh, variance is small, then we can see that, okay, this is a uh, uh, bound state. Uh, if not, then we cannot really uh, identify it as a, a bound state. Of course, if we are sure that uh, this bound state uh, is gone, then we could see that, okay, it's melt. Yeah, that would be my uh, answer. Yeah, but from what you said, it seems like from, at the moment we cannot say unambiguously that uh, we can show that peaks persist about TC or whether they disappear. Wow. Based on Bayesian methods, right? Yeah, it's, it's hard, I would say. Then, of course, then it follows that also extracting from Bayesian methods something like the widths and the peak position is also difficult, if not impossible. So we don't know from QCD what, what the in-medium properties of wow. arconium are. I mean, in some cases, for, for instance, at below TC temperature, it's kind of easy to determine the peak uh, location. But the peak width is is much more difficult. I mean, they are more uh, unreliable. So to the the second part of the question um, about you know comparisons between screened potential models and the lattice data that's coming out now, um, Peter and your talk, you presented some evidence that at finite temperature, this potential model picture kind of breaks down, right? Um, where you extracted the potential from your beta saltpeter amplitudes, and then you tried to use that to get the wave functions, and they didn't agree in the two approaches. So was, was that correct? I mean, that's may maybe trying to put too much uh, into this beta saltpeter amplitude business, because of course, at finite temperature, those are complicated objects, but at least, at least there is no evidence in favor of, of this potential picture where you would expect that, that this higher excited states kind of become bigger because you have a screen potential and then they are loosely bound and therefore bigger in size 
from from what what we can see. Uh, of course, if if you want a comparison between potential models, I mean the simplest way is to do lattice calculation of point meson correlation function, which can be uh, calculated with an NRQCD at sub percent precision, right? And then if you have a spectral function from potential models, which you could also calculate, you could easily go other way around and calculate the corresponding Euclidean correlation function and see if the two matches. And, and so far, uh, when we did this exercise last time with Alexander Rotkopf, we found pretty strong disagreement between the two. So, so what, what considered to be a state-of-the-art potential model for in medium spectral function seems to contradict uh, the direct lattice calculation of the correlation function, and that problem is still out there. So, in this analysis you did, where you uh, you know extracted V of R, is it uh, in that calculation guaranteed to be real valued? Well, I mean that, that's another question. What well, we don't know what what the potential. Well, I mean we, we don't know many things. I mean we don't know if if this idea of, of uh, temperature dependent uh, potential model with screen potential is is a viable one. Uh, if it is, then of course we don't know what the potential should be. And in particular calculations that I was referring to, uh, that comes from Alexander Rodkov, that finds that the real part of uh, the potential is agrees to the single free energy imaginary part more or less compatible with the HTL prediction. And uh, with those two ingredients, of course, you could calculate the spectral functions. But but the, that particular model, of course, seems seems to be in disagreement with direct lattice calculation. Now, of course, you could say, okay, maybe maybe that wasn't the best you could do in terms of the potential, but but that's I mean that at least one way to check, right? So if you want to use the internal energy or some some version of it or whatever else for the real part, you could always cross check with the available lattice results and and then getting them to agree with your potential model will, will not be a trivial task. Okay, so in the second part of my talk, I was talking more about the, the PNRQCD way, where you reduce it down to these, of these coefficients, gamma and kappa, right, which are measurable on the lattice, and I think there's been some considerable progress in that area, right? But um, you would then say, even if I extracted kappa and gamma from these lattice simulations, then it still doesn't guarantee that the potential model is reliable. Yeah, yeah. So, so the PNRQCD is a particular PNRQCD calculation. Is of course mm -hmm. in a certain scale hierarchy, and that that's well, it's already at zero temperature. It's problematic, right? So, so there are no questions that if you have a scale hierarchy, then then of course you could do the calculation. You could justify the potential model. I mean, that that's more or less a straightforward exercise in in effective field theory uh, application. The problem is that in physical world, I mean, when you have to plug in numbers for the binding energy for the temperature, then this scale hierarchy is that is very nice in order to derive uh, this potential PNR QCD and, and thus the potential model is not obvious it's going to work, right? It's the scales are too close to each other and, and therefore the entire framework which reduces the problem to the PNR QCD potential, which essentially Coulomb potential with small temperature dependent correction, which in principle doesn't necessarily contradict the lattice, but, but it's only applicable at very short distances, and kappa and gamma, whether that's, that's a proper way to describe uh, QQ bar uh, in a medium, that's not clear. So it's, it's a problem is a framework, not so much with, with the lattice calculation of gamma and kappa, which itself is a challenging lattice problem, but, but to getting to the point where you could say, well, it's just a perturbative PNRQCD potential plus these two non-perturbative numbers that's based on certain uh, assumption about scale separation. Let me inject here another, another element. Uh, in the real world, uh, not only we have finite temperatures, we also have non-equilibrium um, effects. And uh, that was one of the other questions that we should uh, try to address. How can the non-equilibrium dynamics be added uh, into the problems? 
well, to some extent, Mike addressed this question. So, so you would say non-equilibrium means in terms of uh, deviation from thermal equilibrium. So you have hydro, a version of that, those, so like I hydro, which goes further than the usual hydro. So in, in, in some sense, the medium evolution it, that, uh, can be solved using the standard paradigm of some sort of hydro. I'm not sure that, that hydro is a necessarily the best word here, but, but certainly there is a standard paradigm of how the system evolves in heavy and collision validated by uh, other data than quarkonium. Now, of course, then, then you need a real-time dynamics of your QQ bar pair on top of it. And in principle, if you, there is a scale separation, then this framework of open quantum system combined with PNL QCD is a very fine theoretical framework. The drawback is that it, it's rooted into the scale separation, right? Um, then, of course, you could derive it, and then you have problems. So, and then, of course, if, if that would all go through, then you're left with maybe one or two non-perturbative parameters that you could, as a lattice, so you, in a way you combine uh, non-equilibrium physics through some version of hydro and uh, open quantum system with equilibrium lattice QCD calculation. So it's all in there, but, but that framework is derived under certain assumption, which in the real world may not work. That's a problem. But it's not like, like we are totally naive and we kind of work in a static picture and ignore all this complication related to non-equilibrium. And it has been taken into account at least in one specific um, set of assumptions. Let me ask Michael to comment on that if he wants. Uh, uh, yeah, so um, I don't know what Peter said is, is uh, roughly correct. I mean, in the past, I was, all, I mean, although the hydro does take into account this non-equilibrium deviation in the background itself, um, there, there's still, in, in some part, at least in the open quantum systems framework, a disconnect between the, the, this non-equilibrium deviation of the medium and the quarkonium's response to it. Right? Um, in particular, this large anti pressure anisotropy. Now, in the in the uh, adiabatic case, I was able to take this into account because it was a much easier calculation. But now that we're having to run this big machine, um, if you start introducing these momentum anisotropic potentials, everything becomes uh, much more difficult. You can no longer use a one dimensional Schrodinger equation uh, solver in your evolution. And so I guess the question I'm asking is more is, are there maybe simpler ways to include this effect where we don't have to go to full three-dimensional simulations, A, and B, if there's any hope <laughs> um, for, for Lattice to tell us anything about um, the heavy quark potential in an anisotropic system, I guess. I, I don't know, because in a lattice calculation, we, we could do only thermal equilibrium. So that's the only thing we know, and even that is difficult. So yes, the potential, I would, should rather say static uh, quark and quark energy, uh, we may be able to calculate to some extent. Uh, any, any deviation from equilibrium that of, of the table for lattice, that's not, mm -hmm. not set up for that. Is it because is that's real, real, real time dynamics that's thermalization, and that's not something you could address in, in on the lattice. Yeah, but what but I not, not at least the type of lattice I'm aware of, right? So, yeah, that, that's so that on the, on the other hand, you may think that that where the anisotropies are playing the biggest role, it's early time dynamics, temperature is high enough, uh, so to some extent, you should be able to use weak coupling expansion at early times. And it's not totally outrageous. Of course, how, how valid it is at quantitative level, that's that's a difficult question, but but it's at least not a bad starting point. So in, in a sense, I mean, you don't need the non-perturbative physics down to time equals zero in heavy ion collision, presumably. Yeah. Yeah, so we're, we're doing this, I think I discussed it with you in the past that we're doing these real-time gauge Theory simulations now where we can extract the potential from the Wilson line, the Wilson line correlators. And then the hope is to somehow get out the imaginary part of the potential, at least in a non equilibrium setting. Um, 
Yeah, so that, that's in principle, but that, principle <laughs> doable. But but again, one has to be aware of, of, of different scale separation. I mean, the shape of the potential right. strongly depends on um, the assumption uh, you you use to to derive your your framework, right? So so if mm -hmm. if the Debye mass is the largest energy scale or is the smallest one, that that's an order one change for you get, for what you get in terms of the E medium potential. I'm sorry. And, and in reality, of course, yeah. the Debye mass mm -hmm. is the same as as a thermal scale, so there is no hierarchy for practical matters. Uh, uh, come on, there's a, there's uh, factors there. There's the, yeah, 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 that's of course you depend on the factors, <laughs> which are there or may not be there. Sorry, Alexi, go ahead. Uh, I thought that it could be actually. I think it could be an infinite discussion. It could. So, yeah. Actually, I have. I think I have one small uh, question in the completely different po points and have quarks and so on. Uh, namely, my simple question is how reliable this quark the quark, uh, the quark uh, model is you see usually people to talk about not point like the, the quark but uh, in introducing form fact but actually from simple dimensional re uh, reasoning we could accept that uh, tetra quark should be two times smaller than di quark since it is uh, two times larger uh, heavier and distance in inverse mass then Tetra quark should be two times more than that quark. So how can we uh, how can we believe that simple form factor is enough to explain all these things? You see? Yeah, I I would say you cannot. I mean, the problem what what is being ignored in all this uh, potential model calculation, right? When you talk about di quark in an attractive channel, you ignore the fact that the Q Q is not a color singlet. So right, so you say well, QQ is just a UQ bar uh, with a different Casimir, and and in perturbation theory that's fine, it, that that's really true. However, non perturbative it's not, because you need to neutralize the net color, right? And it's not just just the energy of 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 the Coulomb Coulomb type energy with a different Casimir. It's it's additional non perturbative effects which are going to have. You, you are going to have if you have non-color singlet. So, so now you need to neutralize the color and typically neutralize the color at distance scale of order inverse of lambda QCD. So my naive guess, if, if such an object like a die quark exists, it's, it's typically the size of a hadron. So by no means it's a small. So if you want to make a tetra quark of, of two, two die quarks, if, if that's your model, well, it can be done, but but it's not necessarily uh, smaller than a hadron. A few minutes about the by screening. Well, it's, it's it's not the by screening in a sense. It's it's non perturbative screening. Right? Not, yeah, talking uh, about vacuum. The by right? screening. So vacuum you neutralize a color. For example, you could have a QQ bar in color octet, and and you could have a static quark and the quark in an octet, right? And, but of course that's, that's not a color singlet object and you can calculate the energy of such a state on the lattice. And of course, in addition to the Coulomb repulsion at very short distances, right? It has much positive large energy due to Coulomb repulsion, but that's not the whole story. It has also a large energy uh, because of, of the fact that it's color uh, octet is the core of this object is color octet and to neutralize this color it comes with a non-perturbative gluon field that makes it color singlet and, and this non-perturbative gluon fields then adds about 1 GV energy independent of the distance so so even even at short distances you get much bigger color octet uh, energy than, than than you would naively expect just from from the Casimir. The by screening is the synonym of the screening phase or if we are from confining phase uh, come to the screening phase it is the the confinement phenomenon yeah yeah but but we are talking about zero temperature uh, hadrons physics not about yes. organ plasma nevertheless let us uh, make point about this the by screening let us uh, what is the by screening? It is that screening of column potential, right? 
by Yukawa exponent. Well, wow, that's the new picture, of course, we never seen yes, that. It's net, net results is of the by screening is the precisely Yukawa potential where, where the mass is mass of quasi particle, right? Which is calculable in terms of the, we know how. Uh, let us expand with respect this mass. In the uh, zero approximation, we have column, then constant, and then what? Linearly changing term, but with negative sign. It is important. This term is proportional to the mass square, mass square of the effective particle with negative signs. Uh, from this formula, we obtain column-like formula. If we change just this sign of the sign of m square, we have following picture. We had normal quasi-particle in the screening phase. But in the point when we come to the confining, the mass square of that particle coming zero and then change sign, it becomes tachyon. So in that environment, on the quasi-particle uh, language, confinement, starting of confinement corresponds to tachyon quasi-particles. And technically, we can, uh, by correction, someone, we can somehow change or deform that point. By corrections. We have seen at one talk that uh, temperature corrections to the uh, coronal potential uh, adds to the string tension of the confining part of the potential. Positive, positive uh, correction. So if we were near the phase transition, but in the screening phase, by temperature corrections, we can change the sign of that mass square. So by temperature, we can change phase from the screening come to the confining. This is very clear point and easy to explain, right? Let, Without let me, let me... much, much let, let me jump in uh, in the discussion as uh, as chairperson of, of the discussion. So uh, there are a couple of points. Uh, first, uh, I wanted to say that the lists of questions that we have compiled from what we received, uh, Alexei, uh, Holman and myself, um, those lists are now available in the agenda of the meeting. So uh, they are attached to, to the discussion session so you can download them and have a look at them. Uh, the second point is that uh, we have uh, five minutes uh, before uh, closing the discussion session. Um, there, is there is one question that might have a yes or no answer, so I, I will, uh, I will uh, still ask that one. The others, I'm afraid, they will um, generate uh, open-ended uh, discussions and uh, I, I think uh, <laughs> we don't have uh, um, so much time. Uh, in Moscow it's already almost midnight, uh, it's, it's time to close the meeting. So let me just uh, ask this one last question and then we can have uh, a final minute or two um, if need be. So the, the, the yes or no question is um, the solution of Lindblad equation for the reduced density matrix is numerically expensive even when using the quantum trajectories approach. Could an expansion in the number of quantum jumps reduce the numerical complexity? I, I think Michael was the one asking the question. Um, maybe he can clarify it. Uh, otherwise, uh, if somebody knows the answer and uh, hopefully can give the answer in a matter of uh, one or two minutes, that will be great. 
Yeah, my I, yeah, I added this question. It's mostly is to, to motivate people to look at um, the existing open quantum systems literature to see if uh, there there are these methods called jump expansion methods that can be used. And I have a, I have a, my gut feeling is that this is the the way forward. Um, what when we run our current code, we allow for you know any number of jumps that won't want to happen, but. The ones that have you know a ton of jumps are the ones that end up in high angular momentum states, color octet, and are are unbound. Um, so we're we're doing a lot more work than we we need to. Um, so it's it's more of a suggestion for people to you know go out and think about how um, we can translate one literature into another. That's always a source of inspiration, if nothing else. Uh, Peter, do you want to comment on this? No, I mean it's it's obvious an interesting problem. So so there will be developments in in the coming year, I'm sure. Okay, excellent. So, um, is there any other very quick question that somebody wants to ask uh, just before we pass the the floor to the to the chairman of the meeting? Okay, I think it has been a very long day, uh, at least for yeah, me, yeah, yeah. <laughs> starting okay, at in the morning and it's already midnight. Uh, well, so uh, Roman, please take over. Thanks a lot.